Welcome to episode two of Getting Ready to Row the Indian Ocean. Going to do a quick update on the boat. Quite a lot's happened since last time. Had a few questions about how the boat was built, so I'll um, go into that a little bit, show you how it's constructed, and explain a few of the reasons why I chose some of the materials that we did, and uh, and the boat builder as well. So as you've just seen, we got the vinyl wrap off. It was probably slightly easier getting the wrap off than I thought it would be. You can see I've sanded the boat down in places, but along all the all the edges of the vinyl was a, a tacky adhesive, and that took me quite a long time to get off. In the main, the boat's kind of started to be sanded down, ready for painting. Got to get a move on with the painting because it needs to be 20 degrees-ish. Obviously, I need to do that before the summer's out repainted the garage floor so that keep the dust down just need to cover the walls in in plastic because it's a stone garage and uh, it's a bit dusty in there so once i've done that that should be okay stripped everything off there's no fixtures other than that one cleat i'm struggling to get that off that'll come off today when i finish the video just a little bit more tidying up of the handrails and she'll be ready to start painting you can see i've taken out all the hatches that we spoke about in the last video they're not that easy to get out because they're sealed in with a product called Sikaflex, which is a, a super sealant glue. Even once you've got the, the hatches off, it still takes a lot of peeling off and sanding to, to get back to the surface. So anyway, that's all done. The two vents on either side of where the compass was were solar-powered fans. And for whatever reason, the, the fans weren't working, so I've removed those and I'll put something new in there. I'm not sure whether the fans actually made any difference. I'm going to look at some rechargeable fans for inside the cabin, which I didn't take on either of my first two trips, but we had a couple of handheld ones when Libby and I did the Atlantic, and they made a massive difference to the to the cabin on the hottest days, made sleeping at night better. Compass is obviously out. I can fix the cable in for the, for the light for that. And we took out the big cabin hatch. That was a real challenge to get out. <clears throat> Ended up having to cut the frame in a couple of places with the angle grinder. And again, that was sicker flexed in, so... Yeah, it was really challenging to get out, but as it wasn't sealing properly, it really needed changing. Then inside the cabin, it's been sanded down, ready to start painting. A couple of repairs need doing first, but we're pretty close. But towards the end of next week, I should be able to get the in internal cabins painted and then get the, the boat back in the garage, start doing the, the deck and the, and the hull. Quite happy with where we are with the boat. Still lots to do. Painting's a bit complicated, it's all two-part epoxy paint in the main so I uh, have to be careful anyway quite a few people have, uh, have asked about how the boats built a number of different uh, boats have, have been used for ocean rowing over the last I guess 25 years now since 1997 the first Atlantic rowing race which really kind of properly kicked things off in the in the new era they used a uh, plywood design boat and the plans were made by a naval architect called Phil Morrison. He's done most of the rowing boat designs actually, socks included. You'll see if you watch other rowing videos, flat sections on the hull, especially on the cabins. And uh, the idea was that you could send the plans off to New Zealand or wherever if somebody wanted to row the race, they could build their own boat and then ship it to the, to the race start. They're called the Adkin design, so very similar to socks. Big cabin at the back, very small transom, designed so that the wind flows over the boat although everything that sticks up above the water catches some windage they're designed to not really attract the the wind as much as possible the four cabin next time we have a look at that you'll see that it slopes up and away so any wind that hits it runs off it the transom on the boat is only 13 inches so the original boats were built plywood and then Phil Morrison designed uh, uh, another style of boat which was um, socks. Jamie Fabrizio built most of the, the better versions of that boat. It's a composite boat so rather than being plywood it's uh, closed cell foam in the centre uh, so not like a sponge in, in your bathroom at home where it fills up with water, all the cells fill up with water. 
these air pockets in this foam are sealed so the water can't get in so it's very buoyant but not absorbent at all then on the inside it's just fiberglass the bulkheads for the cabins and the decking are actually plywood the decking is 3 mil ply and it has some reinforcement in certain places but obviously to keep the weight down um, this is 6 mil ply and there's a couple of struts that Jamie inserted to give the, the bulkhead some additional strength that's because a couple of the boats were caught in uh, hurricane conditions after leaving Japan. They were 60 knot winds and they capsized a number of times. There were some rope issues that, that ended up pulling the cleats out of the, the fore cabin and, and there was some damage. But the boats were absolutely fine and survived these massive big cyclones actually. So she built closed cell foam, fiberglass mainly on the inside and then on the outside she's Kevlar. Now you might ask why Kevlar, why not carbon fibre? The thing about carbon fibre is it's only unidirectionally strong, so direct, strong in one direction. So if you have a big sheet of carbon fibre, it's quite easy to punch a hole through it. So if you run into something at sea, you get a crack. And a number of boats have had swordfish. They've hit the boat underneath, obviously they've, they've been attacking something under the boat. The spike come right through the bottom of the boat and broken off. Kevlar is very strong. Uh, is multi-directionally strong hence they use it in bulletproof vests and that kind of thing um, obviously in a slightly different form to, to Mars that's the hull of the boat it's only just over a centimetre wide the really cool thing about socks as opposed to the plywood boats is all the deck compartments are independently buoyant so if you punctured one and you've got a hole somewhere in the boat these compartments would like the Titanic keep you afloat but even if you punctured all of the compartments, because she's foam, she would still float. So in essence, she is unsinkable. A couple of these boats have been abandoned at sea and they end up floating, floating around for a while and then turning up somewhere. Very, very difficult to, to sink. So the, the really cool thing about that is that in essence, you don't need to take a life raft. If you're in one of the plywood boats or you're a fiberglass boat, then you would really need to take a lifeboat because if something happened to the happened to the boat you would need a, a secondary form of survival where with socks the best thing to do is just to hunker down in the cabin if you have a problem and call for help and just sit about and wait so even if you just ended up with the back cabin and the front half of the boat gone you'd still float and um, somebody would be able to find you and rescue you. So the third type of boat, as I kind of just alluded to, are fiberglass boats. They're popped out of a mould, so they're just a fiberglass skin, then bolted together, fittings, cabin fittings, etc. They still have sealed airtight compartments, but on the main, I prefer the, the closed cell foam because of that extra element of safety, and it's very light. The, the, the other big thing about quite a lot of the boats since 2009 been a, a, a new design. Again, it was made by Phil Morrison, who I had a conversation with him and he freely admitted that it was designed to catch the wind, which in my opinion is not rowing. So the, what's happened is that the big cabin, which is at the back, is at the front. So you sit in front of the big cabin, the bulkhead's been straightened up, it has a, a lip around it and it acts basically acts as a sail. So you just sail along with the wind behind you, have got a massive catchment area. Um, and in fact, once you're over kind of three and a half knots in, in a rowing boat, there's not a lot of point in, in rowing too much. And those boats quite regularly get over three and a half knots uh, without anybody at the oars. In my opinion, that diminishes the, the amount of challenge that's in the, in the adventure. I'd much sooner, if I'm gonna spend three years, uh, however much money, time and effort getting ready for a big adventure, I'm not quite sure why I'd then want to take a boat that would diminish the actual challenge and make me come back thinking, well, I've cheated a little bit. A bit like runners cheating their training diaries, putting in miles that they haven't actually run. The only person you're kind of duping is yourself, really. And that's just my opinion, though. I'm quite happy to say to somebody who's rowed in a blowing boat, well done for going to sea. But in my opinion, it's not, it's not rowing. So that's, um, that's boat construction. The more I work on the boat, the more excited I get about it. Um, it's quite nice to be able to do a lot of the work myself as well, so pretty cool. Alright, so that's it for now. Another update in a couple of weeks. Hopefully I'll have some, some of the stuff painted and some of the bits back together. She should be starting to look spiffy and new. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, like and subscribe. Just a quick thank you to everybody who's watched any of the videos recently. Um, had quite a few views in the last month, which was a bit of a surprise. 
never really expected it to go beyond family and friends. Take care until next time.